Folks, I have a very special presentation for you today, something that's been in the works for a long time. And I want to, before I begin, I want to thank a website called trinitytruth.org um, for the research, because an awful lot of what I'm doing here today came from that source, and I really appreciate it. But um, I want to try and get us started here today with a very little story. Very little story. Years ago, I worked with a friend at Kroger who was given to fits of anger. And we've known each other for years and years and years. And we're quite, we're quite friendly, okay? I saw him just before I retired, went to a store for a seminar, and he was working at that store, hadn't seen him in a few years, and we stood there, I bet you, 30, 40 minutes and talked and enjoyed each other's company. But this young man, he's younger than I am, was given to fits of anger when things didn't go his way. And one day we were in the midst of a disagreement about something at work when he said something that just was not true. To which I replied, Bubba, I'm not going to use his name, you know that is not true. Now, when I said to him, you know that is not true, you know what he heard. He heard me saying, you're a lawyer. <laughs> I promise, I didn't. I did not say that. But that's what he understood me to say. Okay? And he threw his arms up over his head. And he screamed at me. And he said, and you call yourself a preacher. <laughs> Something I really don't do. But they know me that way. So I took a few minutes out of my busy schedule to explain to this longtime friend that it is a preacher's job to tell people when they're not telling the truth. Right or wrong? Do you agree? <laughs> Oh, man, you call yourself a preacher. Is it not my job as the preacher to tell you when things aren't right, if something's not going right? And the question is, do you want me to point it out when things are not as they are supposed to be? Well, this next slide... I'm almost ashamed, ashamed of. But I'm assuming everybody here knows about the evolution chart of man. You know what that is, right? That's it. I found one that doesn't show a bunch of detail. They usually have naked people on them, and I didn't want to look at naked men today. <laughs> but I did want to put this up there for just a moment to illustrate something. I want to assure you that our study has nothing to do with this chart here today. But I showed you this chart so that my next slide will hopefully make more sense. You know about this. Well, here's my chart for today. Our, t our title of our presentation today is What Happened to the Hymnal? And the pictures here are supposed to be kind of like that evolutionary chart, but for hymnals. But of course, if you have to explain things too much, it's probably not all that clever anyway, is it? Well, what happened to the hymnal? And I want to start with a Bible verse. Psalms 100. It's actually a chapter, not a verse. Psalms 100 in the Bible says... Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Amen? Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of 
His pasture. But look at this. Enter into His gates. I want to say that's His gate back there. Amen? Amen. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endureth to all generations. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. There is an old song that I really appreciate the words that I want to add to this. It was written by an old gospel singer named Joel Hemphill, and the song is called Let's Have a Revival. And it's not the style of song that we would ever do in this room. Okay? I'll be the first to admit that. But I really appreciate this man's writing abilities. I really appreciate one of the verses in this song. It goes like this. It says, I asked an old time preacher how revival came back there. He said, we always started down on our knees in prayer. Amen? next line says just open up those two books the song book and the Bible and the last line says if you'll preach and sing God's word you'll have a revival if you'll sing and preach God's word you'll have a revival. Now, to me, that means that revival has something to do with the truth. Amen? And it also says to me that the Bible and the songbook need to be closely connected together. Okay? You don't just sing songs to feel good. You don't just sing songs to sound pretty. They mean something. It's a sermon in every song. And I, for one, you know, I've preached a lot of sermons. But I marvel at what people do with their songs how the man that writes the verse can say in just a moment of time what I stand up here for an hour and try to get out. I think, it's, I think it's a wonderful gift that God gives to men. Well, I want to tell you about a man. In the early days of the Great Awakening of the early 1800s, one of those who responded to the preaching of William Miller was a 21-year-old school teacher from Palmyra, Maine, named James Springer White. His father and two of his sisters attended the Maine Eastern Christian Conference to be held in the town of Knox. A storm caused them to spend the night in a wayside tavern. That evening, the landlord and his guest were entertained by the white, listen to this, the white Second Advent Quartet. The white Second Advent Quartet. Singing songs about the coming of Jesus. In the morning, the proprietor of the tavern canceled their bill and invited them to come back and make that place their home whenever they passed by that way. So, that little story is to illustrate how important, how very important James White thought music was. 
Amen? And he's one of the main pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Well, in 1849, he published the first Seventh-day Adventist. There wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist church in 1849. That didn't happen until 1863. But as far as the movement goes, this was the first Seventh-day Adventist hymn book, Hymns for God's Peculiar People that Keep the Commandments of God and the Faith of Jesus. Amen? I said this back when we were going over those Review and Herald articles. I really appreciate the fact that they were specific in their titles back in those days. You knew there was a mission in there. Amen? But as the movement grew, this first songbook compiled by James White was published and consisted of 53 hymns. Words only. No music, just the words. Four years later, the second edition came out. Again, published by James White, Hymns for Second Advent Believers Who Observe the Sabbath of the Lord. Amen? And that was 1852. And it had 139 hymns. Still, words only, but it had 139 now. Then the next book, and this one, if you can read it, it says 1876. The next hymn book actually came out in the year 1869 and was called Hymns and Tunes for Those Who Keep the Commandments of God and the Faith of Jesus. This was a reprint of that same book because it has the exact number of songs and pages, 424, by the way. Then, here's a later version of Hymns and Tunes that was published in 1886. That brings us up to a hymnal called Christ in Song that was published in 1909 which contained 950 songs along with their music. And if you've ever seen one of these books, and I have because this is the hymnal that we used here in this church for the first several years of our existence. But if you've ever seen, when you opened it up, you see it's oblong, but when you opened it up, there would be four hymns on every open page. Two on this side, two on this side. Sometimes there would be a couple of other ones mixed in that didn't have the music for them. What would you want to say? They're all still right there. In yeah, we've got the books. Yeah. We've got the books. Many of them are still here. What was happening is this book is a hundredth year anniversary edition and it's hardback. And I suppose that the original ones were hardback, but the ones we had here were all paperback. We had gotten them from maybe somebody like Leaves of Autumn or something like that. And, uh, you know, they just wouldn't stand the test of time. They started falling apart on us. But anyway, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And then, the next one, some of you more ancient folks out there are probably going to remember this one, right? Because this is what you probably grew up in the church. The 1941 version. The church hymnal. Okay? And then, what you see before you in the pews. Nin excuse me. 1985 was the year that the so-called new Seventh-day Adventist hymnal was published and put into use. It doesn't say new anywhere on it, but that's what it was called at the time. I remember that. So, my question for you is, up to this point, how important is the hymnal? Okay, back up a step. How important is singing to our worship? 
There's a quote in your bulletin today that says that singing is just as important a part of worship as is prayer. That's right. So it's very, very important. And our pioneers believed that. I've spent a few minutes here to show you that I think it is very important. Just open up those two books, right? The songbook and the Bible. If we'll sing and preach God's Word, there's a revival in it, amen? Very, very important to our worship experience in church. But again, I want to back up and ask the other question again. How important is the hymnal to that worship experience? And I'm going to see if I can illustrate this another way. Look at this. Does it really matter what book we use? Or could we use any book? Could we use any, let's say, best-selling book? Like this one on the right that obviously is a bigger seller than the Seventh-day Adventist one. I'm sure it's a better seller. I'm also sure that there are a lot more people in this world that love it. What do you think? Does it really matter? See, I hope by putting it up this way that it becomes really obvious how important the difference in our song book is. The singing of praises to God through the use of hymns is a long-held tradition among Adventists. Hymns are a, are a reminder of the way God has led us in the past, and it's a great source of encouragement for each and every one of us as we struggle through life. Now, it was with the release of the church hymnal in 1941 that a imperceptible, almost imperceptible change began to happen in Adventism. And that's right, I said the hymn book published in 1941. Doctrinal deviation from accepted Adventist teaching had never been sanctioned in a church hymnal before. Think about it. Why would you put somebody else's doctrine in a Seventh-day Adventist hymnal? Now, obviously, reason with me, there's going to be Baptist doctrine in a Baptist hymnal. Right? We don't begrudge them that, do we? That's where I grew up, by the way. There's going to be Methodist doctrine in a Methodist hymnal. And yes, Catholic doctrine in a Catholic hymnal. But we wouldn't expect to see Baptist doctrine in a Catholic hymnal, would we? We wouldn't expect to see Catholic doctrine in the Baptist hymnal either, would we? And yet, in 1941, when they published that hymnal, more Catholic and Anglican hymns appear. Do you know what an Anglican is? I know Robin does. She used to work for one. The Anglican, the word Anglican means the same as white or English. It's been used. It's, it's interchangeable in history. So the Anglican church was the Episcopal church. What's the difference in the Episcopal church and the Catholic church? Not much difference at all. Actually, their doctrines are essentially the same, but they don't acknowledge the Pope. That's the big difference. Okay? So it's basically Catholicism without a Pope. 
And that does make it better. Doesn't make it good. Amen? Doesn't make it right. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. But more Catholic and Anglican hymns appeared in this new songbook in 1941, and a shift in theology was reflected in the words of some of the hymns. Only a few years before the hymnal was published, the first church manual had been published in the Adventist church. And this shift in theology found in the fundamental beliefs and the hymnal was the introduction of Trinitarianism into the church. Okay? And that cannot be avoided. What I'm going to do today is show you the evidence for what I just said so lightly and hopefully the weight of the evidence will um, impress you. But, 1980 is when this book was published. And of course, you know that this book was in response to the newly voted on doctrine at the 1980 general conference session the doctrine of the Trinity was accepted before that time and, and that may be a shock to you guys it may sound funny but historically Seventh-day Adventists did not believe in the Trinity we here do not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity we believe in the Father and we believe in the Son and we believe in their Spirit but that's not what is being taught in this Trinitarian doctrine. But anyway, that was officially voted a part of the church in 1980. And so, this book was published in 1980 to confirm all of that. Things were changed in this book that had never been in existence in Adventism before. And then... In 1985, after one more general conference session down in New Orleans, they published and started putting out this hymnal. Now that's when I joined the church, it was 1985. And so these things were being brought in, and I had no clue. I went from being a, a, a Baptist Trinitarian to being a Seventh-day Adventist Trinitarian and never knew the difference. Okay? But that's, that's a story I'll have to tell some other time. But it's very important that we understand that in this latest release, there are more and more changes that if you pay attention, should do more than raise our eyebrows, folks. As in the story of the frog. You all know about the frog. You put the frog in room temperature water. What happens if you throw the frog in the hot boiling water? He jumps right back out. He's hardly hurt by it at all. But if you put him in comfortable enough water and you raise the temperature just slightly, eventually he's boiling, isn't he? The change in Adventist doctrine crept in slowly and quietly and only a few of uh, the people realized what was really going on there. Now, there are many hymns which have either been added from non-Adventist sources or have had their words changed from the previous editions and to me that's a real telltale sign so that outside doctrine was being taught through their words in this hymn book. These subtle changes in the wording of hymns are probably acceptable to the vast majority of newer um, generations, if you will, of Adventists because most of us came from other churches, didn't we? And if I came out of the Baptist church and I'm not going to notice anything amiss about this, but I will tell you, I remember when this happened. 
And I, I've told y'all that I fell in with the old men in the church, the conservative ones early on. And I praise the Lord for that because I got a fast education. But there were plenty of them that were upset by this hymnal. Me? I thought it was the neatest book I'd ever seen before. Why? Because they keyed it down where a man could sing and not blow the top of his head off. I just thought it was the most wonderful hymnal I'd ever seen. But what is the really important thing here? Well, I want to show you some of the changes to the hymnal. That's what today is going to be about. So that we can better understand the direction being taken by our church and the people who prepared this book. So please, bear with me. The very first thing I want to show you is this. There's a Trinity section in there. And guess what? That had never existed in any of the other books before that. Does that mean something? I certainly think that it does. A Trinity section. But oddly enough, hymns with Trinitarian concepts are not confined to that section, as we shall see. There's only like seven in this section. There's many, many of these new Trinitarian hymns. Another interesting addition was the inclusion of a corporate reading section at the rear of the hymnal. Now, you have to understand that in the 1941 version of the hymnal, there was 53 of these responsive readings in the back of the book, and all of them were Bible and Bible only. No men's words, all scriptures, and all King James Version of the scriptures, which by and large, most Baptist and Seventh-day Adventists agree is the best version of the book to begin with. Okay? Now, from 53 of these things, and all being King James Version, we go to 225 in the version of the hymnal that we have here in this church, okay? And we'll talk more about that as we go. But it's obvious in these so-called responsive readings that it gives us more the feel of Roman Catholic or Anglican and that's what they claim that they were trying to do in this book. Now, before the 1985 General Conference session in New Orleans, much had been said about the development of this new Seventh-day Adventist hymnal. It was introduced at that se session with much interest and huge sales. But this new hymnal introduces into the Seventh-day Adventist worship service hymns and scripture readings containing Roman Catholic teachings not found in any earlier Adventist hymnal. Now I want to say this. There are all these things in this book and we have never one time in this church done a responsive reading. Just not interested in it here. I wasn't comfortable with it when I was in the conference churches because you don't know what it is you're going to say until after you've said it. I don't like responsive readings. If we did them out of the Bible and I was reading it out of my Bible, I might be okay with it. But I don't trust you well enough for me to stand up and read something and say something, and I'm not going to know what I've said until I've said it. That doesn't make sense to me, so I never participated. When they would do that at the churches that I've been members of, I would stand there and I would read the things, but I wouldn't say it out loud. Maybe you think I'm crazy, uh, but, you know, Amy Grant had a song named El Shaddai, 
that was really popular a few years ago. And I've heard that song. I've listened to her sing it. And it is beautiful. She's got a beautiful voice. It's a beautiful song. But I cannot be comfortable singing words that I have no idea what I'm saying. I think that's wrong. Anyway, I want to go on. So, there's this difference. 53 in the old one, all of them King James Version. Now there's 225 passages of, it says, Scripture, and they're broken up into different categories, including 135 responsive readings, 14 canticles and prayers, 36 calls to worship, 13 words of assurance, 14 offertory sentences, and 13 benedictions. And just so we get the full impact of this, I made a pie chart. Not something I've ever done before. This chart represents not what I just read to you, but it represents the various Scripture versions that are used in this new book. Okay? Different Bible versions that are used in the Seventh Day or the new Seventh Day Adventist hymnal published in 1985. Oh, but I didn't label the chart, did I? Would anybody like to guess which of these pieces of the pie represents the King James Version of the Bible? No, no, no. Let me do that. I will tell you, it's not the big blue section up there on the top right. That's the New International Version. And it's not the big orange slice of pie there on the bottom right. That's, listen, that's the Jerusalem Bible. Do you know about the Jerusalem Bible? Sounds Christian enough. No, the Jerusalem Bible is a Catholic version of the Scriptures. Roman Catholic translation. No, it's not that big gray slice that you see right in front either. That's the New King James Version at 14%. Again, it's not the nice-sized yellow slice of the pie over there on the left because that's the Revised Standard Version at 12%. And then there's the light blue section up there, but that represents the New English Bible at 10%. And then that green slice up there on the top left is the Good News Bible. 7%. Then, that dark blue slice up there is the King James. Also at 7%. And then that last one... I can't remember what it was. Ah the New American Standard Bible at 2%. That's the way it lines up. In other words, that's the King James. That's all of the non-King James versions. Now, it is shocking that in our church hymnal, the Roman Catholic Jerusalem Bible is used more than two and a half times more than the Protestant King James Bible. The relegation of the King James Version to less than 7% of the passages demonstrates something, doesn't it? It demonstrates a move away from the Bible of the Reformation. The Bible that established the Seventh-day Adventist church. As well as the Bible used 100% of the time in the previous version of the Seventh-day Adventist church hymnal. 
Does that mean something? I should, I should think so. Now think about it. To cite the Roman Catholic Jerusalem Bible over twice as many times as the Protestant and the much more accurate King James Version demonstrates a thinking that does not look good on our resume. Are we Protestants or aren't we? Wow. The fearfully faulted and inaccurate New International Version, which is not a Protestant version, is used five, almost five times as much as the King James Version. Is that in the responsive reading? Yes, that's in the responsive readings yeah. section. We're going to talk about those. Number 756 from Psalms 51, but it's in the New International Version, teaches the Catholic doctrine of original sin. That this hymnal would refer and would prefer the NIV translation of Psalms 51 with its blatant distortion of Scripture in order to uphold the disgraceful concept of original sin, and that's something that we have been chasing our tail on for many years now in the Seventh-day Adventist church, is just unbelievable. It reads, Surely I have been a sinner from birth. That's what the NIV says. The Bible says that my mother I was shaping in iniquity because of my mother. That's saying my mother was a sinner. It's not saying I'm a sinner. My mother's a sinner. Now, if my mother's a sinner, what nature do I have? I have hers. Okay? And there's no mistaking that. Okay? That's an important subject as well. But when you leave that out and you go right to the original sin thing, it's a problem. It's a problem. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Hymnal Committee has included these apostate doctrines of the fallen churches of Babylon. That is the way Seventh-day Adventists see it. Do they not? Supposedly, in our official teaching, it is difficult to believe that there was not a determined element on the committee that deviously implanted Roman Catholic concepts into this hymn. And most certainly, they were fully aware of what they were achieving. And I'm going to show you that here in just a moment. There is a term that we've talked about many times here. It's called liturgy. And you can see what the dictionary says. A form or formula according to which public religious worship, especially Christian worship, is conducted. Now, what's your definition of Christianity? What's God's definition of Christianity? Doesn't always match. Right? But liturgy is a word that literally means how we worship God. It's the formula we use to worship God. And it says here that this word is especially Christian and gives as an example the Church of England. Well, I've already told you that the Church of England is one step from Catholicism. Right? The only difference is they don't accept the Pope. Or generally speaking, that's the only difference. But, what does the Bible recognize when you say the word Christian? That can be something completely different. Well, I'm going to show you what it maybe is not. And I want to show you a few things. These are just, I took pictures with my phone and I cut them out. 
In the back of this hymnal that we have here, there is a section in the back called Canticles and Prayers. Now, some people may not even know what a canticle is. It's not a word that we use or have enjoyed using for a really long time. A canticle is a song. Really, it's a special kind of song. It's a chant. In the Protestant Bibles, there's a book entitled Song of Songs, right? Written by Solomon. But in the Catholic Bibles, it's not called Song of Songs. It's called Canticles. Not to say that there's anything evil about the word, but folks, it's not a word generally used by Protestants. Okay? If you pick up a Bible and it says canticles in it and you trace it back, I promise you, you're going to find a Catholic Bible. It's not going to be a Protestant Bible. It's going to be slanted toward the Catholic way of seeing things. Folks, it's not a word generally used by Protestants and especially not by Seventh-day Adventists before this hymn. But I want to look at a few of these other terms. Here's one. The Sanctus. That particular one that that's on is known as, in the Catholic Church, the Sanctus. Do you know what the Sanctus is? Everybody, let me know. Let me know. How much you know about this? I certainly didn't know what the Sanctus was. This is number 833. The Sanctus. And it's entitled, Holy, 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 which is also the title of one of the hymns in the book. And we'll talk about it too. But the term Sanctus means a hymn beginning. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. Literally, Holy, Holy, Holy. But listen, the next words. Forming a set part of the Mass. What is the Sanctus? It's what they use to begin the Mass. I don't want to have a Mass. don't know why I have the song in my book. Here's another one. Number 835 is commonly called the Magnificat. This one, 836, is commonly called the Benedictus. And I would guess that that means the benediction, but I was wrong. That's not what it is at all. Here's another one, commonly called the Nunc Dimittis. Probably not even saying that right. Not trying to, but I don't really care that much about it. These are all Latin words. And who uses Latin? Doctors, lawyers or judges, and it is the official language of one nation in the world. The Vatican. That's exactly right. Which is another way of saying what you said to start with. The Catholic Church. One more. This one is De Profundis on number 832 there. And I'm not going to spend time on these. I just think, you know, look down at the bottom. Paul's doxology. When I joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1985, the church I was at sang every single Sabbath. The doxology. Okay? That was perfect in my mind. Because the Baptist church that I grew up in sang the doxology every single week. It was part of the worship service. And so we were just going on in the same tradition. But I'm learning about things. Why do we have canticles and not songs? Why do we have chants? Why do we have all these things that I don't know what they are? And by the way, if you look at these things in the back of the book, they are not labeled. 
the people that did the research on this had to go through and look up every single one of those things and find out what version it was. They don't tell you. There's a page, an introduction page, where they tell you what all's there. But they don't tell you which one or what. So I can't even pick. It would take some work just to pick out the King James Version ones if I wanted to do that. Anyway, there are several hymns that have either been added to the hymnal or had their wording changed to teach this Catholic doctrine that I'm talking about. And it's only natural that we think this must have been a mistake. I mean, if you first just stumbled into this information, you would think so. And I certainly believe that it was a mistake. But I don't think it was an accident. They did it on purpose. It was part of the master plan. So, by the way, God's got a master plan. The devil does too. The question is, whose master plan are we following? I'm sorry, but I've got to tell it like it is. Was it accidental? The answer is no. And you might ask me, how do you know that it's not accidental? I have an answer for that. The answer rings very clear in what the Adventist Church hymnal tells us. The very pages that you hold before you in the introduction. Look at this. It says, the committee has sought hymns well suited for congregational singing and examined each one for scriptural and doctrinal soundness. Do we believe that they're telling me the truth here? If they, they I mean, they're telling me they know what they were doing. They really worked at this. The committee sought hymns well suited and examined each one for what? Scriptural, Scriptural and doctrinal soundness. Now look, they sought hymns that affirm the distinctive beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists as well as those that express points of faith that we hold in common with other Christian bodies. That would be okay if we have a doctrine in common with Baptists or Methodists or Lutherans or whoever. That's okay. No, no problem there. But now look, hymnals old and new provided text and tunes of enduring value from other churches. Sometimes it was actually necessary to alter the text of these hymns to eliminate theological aberrations or awkward, jarring expressions. Sometimes we just didn't like the way it was worded. So we changed it. So are they paying attention? They know what they're doing. Part of the plan, like I said. Now, look at this. With great caution. examined each one with great caution. The text committee replaced archaic and exclusive language whenever this could be done without disturbing familiar phrases, straining fond attachments, or doing violence to historical appropriateness. To me, that's a bunch of my, my, my. Driven by a lawyer. Yeah, that sounds like it's written by a lawyer. <laughs> that sounds like what you say when you're trying to slip something by. So that it's called a disclaimer. But now, please, look at this. With great caution, they replaced archaic and exclusive language. What is canticles? I know it's songs. I know it's chants. But is it not archaic? Is that a word that you've probably ever used in your life? It's archaic. 
but they didn't replace it. They specifically added it. An exclusive language. What would that be? Well, exclusive language to me would be a word that says this is Catholic. You know, there shouldn't be words that make it just one thing because we're trying to do things that we can agree on. We don't want something that's exclusive. Anyway, this goes, this goes on and on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop for today and I'm going to give you the choice whether you want to come back next week. <laughs> I suspect some of you might not want to. You might, you might think this is so much dribble. How many of the rest of the story? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you what the rest of the story is going to be. The rest of the story is going to be showing you the overt Catholic doctrine that is in that book. The flamboyant. That's a word we use for gay people. We say flamboyant because well, they're just over the top. I can put up with so much, but I can't put up with that. That's how we use that word. And that's how I'm using that word to talk about this subject. I hope that when you see, just as a, hopefully, invitation to get some of you back here. See the numbers I have written down here on this piece of paper? Yeah. I don't know how many that is. It's a lot. More than 10. More than 10. More than 20. These are the songs that I feel convicted have to get out of this church. Period. Say that one more time. These are the songs that I believe have to get out of this building. Oh. Period. Period. Shouldn't have ever been in here. So, there's my shock for you. We'll see who shows up next week. You want me to do one? Just to give you an idea of what's coming. I'll do one. The song is hymn number three. God Himself is with us. Verse two of this hymn also elevates the Roman Catholic concept of Mary. Come abide within me. Let my soul like Mary be thine earthly sanctuary. Now this is not a song that I think I've ever sung. So obviously I don't know what's in there. But can you imagine that Seventh-day Adventists might be singing these songs and not knowing what they're talking about? Yeah. Just, just for those of you that know the answers to the question, what's the problem with marry anything? In a word, in a word, in is Mary in heaven? Is Mary alive? Now, Catholicism says she's not only the mother of God, she's the queen of heaven, she is immaculately conceived and never sin. knew sin. The Bible says all have come short, right? Of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Right? The only person that doesn't go into that category is Jesus. Amen? So, this song is teaching you to just say, and it's old English, and it's easy for it to just roll off the tongue, and you wasn't paying attention, no way. What does it matter? It's not important. Well, when you have that many of them, 
it gets kind of hard to avoid. It says, this again assumes that Mary is still alive. Gerhard Terstegen wrote the words of this hymn in German. Listen to this. A literal translation of the German words that he originally penned possesses no reference to Mary at all. <coughs> so, from some means, some source, we have put a version of this song in our hymn book that has been altered. It's not even the right words to the song. But it has false doctrine in it. And it tells us down at the bottom, the original words were, Lord, come dwell in me. I'm singing the song. Lord, come dwell in me. Let my heart and my spirit be another temple for thee. Is that good words? Yes, absolutely it is. But when you change it, and you have let my soul like Mary be thine earthly sanctuary. That, that draws up a whole bunch of different pictures in my opinion. I mean, why, folks? The only point I'm making here, why did the Adventist Church Hymnal Committee that searched that with great caution did these things. Accept a Catholic change to an originally Protestant hymn. Is that not a worthwhile question to ask? Now, if that was the only one, I'd be the first one to tell you that wouldn't be that big a deal to me. I can ignore that one. I don't sing it anyway. when we see dozens of these things. And there's other stuff I'm not going to tell you about now that just make it so very suspect. Why? Why at this stage of the game we're saying that we believe Jesus is coming soon. Right? Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. That's a Seventh-day Adventist key song, isn't it? At this late stage of the game, why? Are we not telling people about Jesus' is coming, but we're telling people about all this other extemporaneous stuff? Isn't that interesting? Well, it certainly smacks of confusion to me. It sure does. Well, folks, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to invite you all to come back next week.